Julie's coming up. Um, uh, th thank you, Tony. That was great. Um, <clears throat> Julie's coming up, and Julie, uh, we had a conference call. Um, Julie Silver is uh, amazing, has done amazing rehab work. And on the conference call, she taught me this new word, which is prehabilitation. I've been talking about it ever since, and I'm so excited because you may know it already or not, but here it is. <laughs> thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I had to tell my mom. And I was really worried about that. And so what I did was I got my brother and sister to sit with my mom. And we were 3,000 miles away. My mom was in California, and I was in Boston. So I called at the appointed time. And I started talking, about, talking to my mom about the fact that, um, you know, even though uh, some people have delays in their, in their diagnosis, and I had a two-year delay in my diagnosis, three workups, the third one finally was positive, um, right where I uh, thought I had a problem. And um, so I'm telling my mom these statistics and kind of having this conversation. And my mom says to me, Julie, I don't really know what you're talking about, but your brother is really upset right now, and I need to talk to him. <laughs> That's a true story. So, <laughs> so cancer affects the, the individual, right, and it affects the family. And I had three little kids at home, and my littlest one was in diapers. And um, I, you know, my kids have lived through the, the whole cancer experience. And, and my daughter, when she was applying for college, every single one of her college essays was about cancer. Not my cancer and not her cancer, but how my cancer affected her. And that's been um, something that has really informed her experience. So I think the, the work that you all are doing and the work that we do in rehabilitation, um, we care a lot about families. And we also care about the patients themselves. And they go hand in hand. It's, it's hard to separate those two things. I want to do a really fast um, you know, look at cancer and um, rehabilitation. I really want to do rehabilitation and prehabilitation, but I'm using cancer as a model because I'm going fast. Um, and I hope that, that you'll forgive me that I can't cover more diagnoses. I'm going to try to throw in a few examples. But I thought you would understand this better if I actually um, used cancer as an example. So. What's an impairment versus what's a disability? <coughs> right. An impairment is really what you see on physical examination. Disability is what you can't do because of that. So a fast example is going to be the Boston Marathon bombings. Remember those bombings? That's where I'm from, Boston. And um, we took care of, of um, most of those um, uh, people who actually lost limbs. We, we took care of them at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital and um, have a couple movies coming out um, on that. And so they lost a limb, right? And let's say they lost a limb below their, below their knee. That's their impairment. What's their level of disability, though? What if, what if they're, they're missing their leg and you don't put a prosthesis on and you don't do any gait training? How am I going to get from here to over here if I don't have a prosthesis and there's no gait training? Right? I'm have to, so that's, that's pretty disabled. That's really hard, isn't it? What if I put a prosthesis on what if I do gait training? What if I teach them how to walk and run? And what if they then, the next year, run the Boston Marathon? That's a totally different level of disability, right? So impairment and disability aren't the same. And in fact, the impairment didn't change. The only thing that changed was the rehabilitation. That changed the disability. So really important to understand the difference between impairment and disability. And there we go. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so I talk a lot about impairments. We think about them a lot when we're coding um, patients, when we're doing diagnosis. I know. Ah. Oh, all right, sorry. I don't know what's, what's going on with the clicker. I talk a lot about impairments because it's easy. That's the way we're trained in medicine, and, and oncologists are trained that way, and so on. And people understand impairments more easily sometimes than they understand function and other terms. So I often just use impairment to... Um, as a way to fast track an explanation. So if you think about um, impairment driven rehabilitation, it's really focusing on a specific problem versus general exercise that would be for good for cardiovascular health and so on. And when you look at what's happened sort of in oncology, and when I went through cancer treatment, I felt really good in the beginning and I got sicker and sicker as I went along. And when I was sicker than I had ever been, my oncologist said, okay, you're done and try to heal yourself. And I had lots and lots of impairments, and I never was offered palliative care. I was never offered um, rehabilitation. 
I just had to figure out how to fix all these different things. And I can tell you the general exercise did not fix them because the general exercise isn't really um, designed to treat impairments. So think about this. If you go through cancer treatment, there's a lot of stuff that happens, let's just say from, the, from here up, right? If you have head and neck cancer and you have like a radical neck dissection or modified um, neck dissection, or if you have breast cancer and you have a mastectomy, or if you have lung cancer and you have a thoracotomy or whatever, there's a lot of stuff going on up here that putting a pedometer on and walking 10,000 steps a day is not gonna fix. So it's really important to understand that these are in the same family, but they're not the same. And I've written a lot about that, about this idea that we really need to screen for impairments and we need to identify them in order to treat them so that patients have better outcomes because impairments are often very predictive of disability. Not always. You can have a minor impairment and a lot of disability or a really big impairment and not very much disability. So they're not always predictive, but they're often predictive. So um, we have at least a couple of physiatrists in the room. Andrea, are you, Andrea Cheville here, she's, she's one of my colleagues. I have to be careful because she's so smart and she knows like, you know, everything in rehabilitation medicine, so I gotta be careful what I present in front of her. Is there anybody else in here who's rehab medicine? <laughs> I know. <laughs> got a ringer in the crowd, uh-oh. All right, so, um, so, you know, physiatrists, I always say my sister, my little sister took the easy way out, she became a pediatrician. I mean, first of all, everyone knows what she does. My mom can't even figure out what I do, but she knows what my sister does. Second of all, I always tease her and I say, you're not even a real doctor because half the patients you see are healthy. Every person I see is sick. So she doesn't really appreciate that, but we're actually really good friends. So physiatrist, that's a doctor in rehab medicine, and we treat really, really sick people usually. We also sometimes treat ankle sprains and other things, but we have very medically complex people. And then also we work with rehab nursing, rehab psychology, PT, OT, et cetera. And then there's a transition to the community or transition to fitness professionals. So... And that's really important to think about when you're, when you're working in palliative care, to think about treating those impairments and how the rehab team can help you with that. Of course, we want to involve those, those loved ones. I mentioned that. And I also want to just say that rehabilitation medicine is not new. It's been around for decades. There's all this science behind it, all this literature, all this training. So, you know, really think about those rehab professionals who can help your patients, who also get reimbursed by third-party payers for that care. It's really important to make sure to bring those folks in. So unfortunately, a lot of times they aren't brought in. So we have 529 older cancer patients. How many of them um, you know, should have been sent for OT and PT because they had problems? Um, and how many actually got the care? So you know, 65% had problems. All right, and they were potentially modifiable. So remember somebody said earlier today about unnecessary suffering? That's the unnecessary suffering. There's so much suffering already. You know, it's the unnecessary part that we really have to address because that's really all we can do. So that's a lot of unnecessary suffering if only 9% receive this treatment, right? That's a lot of unnecessary suffering for care that's probably at the hospital anyway in the rehab department that's covered by insurance that just needs someone to say hey go over to that rehab department and see those people all right how does that relate to disability um, you know very strongly there's study after study that shows that um, physical and functional problems are very strongly related to um, distress to disability etc um, really want to just you know highlight this and you don't have to read this but I'm just trying to say that you know it also affects quality of life lots of studies on this we know that people when they physically feel better their quality of life improves so we want to tackle that unnecessary suffering um, and you know lots and lots of literature that I can point you to on this topic um, just to sort of make the point but really want to say that distress and disability and quality of life are all very, very intimately related. So prehab. We started thinking about prehab. Actually, um, it was sort of a, like a boot camp kind of thing. We were sending people, you know, there was a big stressor coming up. Um, you know, soldiers were going off to war and so on. We said, what, what would happen if we actually, you know, fed them and had them exercise and run and do all these things? Would they do better with this big upcoming stressor? 
And that, and so they started with, you know, boot camps and things like that, and then they started doing that to patients. They said, oh, you're going to have, um, you know, a, a coronary artery bypass graft, or you're going to have um, a cancer treatment, or you're going to have an orthopedic knee surgery or whatever. What if we actually did something before you got on the operating table? Would that help you? And I always use the marathon example because it's really easy to understand, like, would you ever just say, hey, just go run the Boston Marathon next weekend. Don't train for it or anything. You don't need protein supplementation. You don't need to train for it. Just have it, and let's see how you do. So in anticipation of whatever's coming up, there is often a window of time when you could actually try to get that person stronger and healthier. And so we think about that a lot with surgery. And that's, the, that's what the care continuum looks like. And there's this thing called early um, recovery programs, or ERAS, um, or ERAS, or whatever, however you like to pronounce it. Different, different um, people pronounce it different ways. But it's basically this perioperative period. And that's been well studied. And we say, oh, gee, if we get people up early, if we limit their, um, their fluids, if we control their pain, they do better. Back it up a little bit, not just those 24, 48 hours perioperatively, but back it up and get them to stop smoking and exercise and increase their protein um, supplementation and so on, and they'll probably do a lot better. So prehab, really important. And, you know, people are writing about this and saying, like, why aren't we doing this? You know, uh, hello, it just makes sense. I mean, let's take a page out of the sports medicine textbook and just say, you know, let's do prehab. It really makes a lot of sense for these folks. And by the way, you don't have to have surgery um, for prehab, you can, and you don't have to have early stage disease, you can actually benefit even if you have multiple comorbidities, multiple problems. Um, you know, this is one with liver metastasis, et cetera. So um, really, you know, just sh highlighting some research and showing you that this exists in the literature, this idea that we could do a lot better. All right. What about if you operated on people and they didn't have any, client, any signs of malnutrition and then you still supplemented them with protein and you still um, did some nutritional things, would they do better? And the answer is yes. Just like someone who's running a marathon would do better if you did some extra nutritional supplementation. This is the first time that anybody really looked at this because what people did is they screened for nutritional problems and they said, well, if you start out with a problem, then we'll supplement you. What if you don't start out with a problem? Supplement them anyway. Glycemic control, protein supplementation, give them some prehab and not just exercise only. Prehab can really be helpful. Does the delivery matter? Yes, the further you move the patient away from that care team, the less control you have. You don't want to be doing prehab off over there somewhere. Someone has to be in charge, and, and this is medical care. You can think about um, this in terms of trying to decrease hospital lengths of stay, metastatic workups, returning to work, um, cluster symptoms like anxiety, insomnia, and pain, which go together. So. Lots of things, lots of opportunities for both prehab and rehab. And this gets into what's called the triple aim. So the triple aim is that idea that you have to do three things at once. And this is really hard. There's very few examples of triple aim or value-based care because it's so hard to do them all three at one time. You have to, number one, make your patient happier. You have to decrease the cost of your patient's care. And you have to have better outcomes. And the outcome doesn't have to be um, longer life, per se. It, ha it could be fewer um, emergency department visits or you know, all kinds of different ways you can measure outcomes. Maybe they're stronger. So hard to do, but you definitely can do that um, if you're thinking about what impairments might they have. So remember when the stories that we heard, and a lot of times, the, the one story that was hard was the um, one with um, Sjogren's, right? And they said, we didn't know what to expect. But a lot of the story said, we knew what to expect. We knew what kinds of problems. I know what kind of problems a head and neck cancer patient's going to have. I know they're going to be different than a breast cancer patient. And I know those are going to be different than a lung cancer and a colon cancer. And I know they're going to be different than MS, right? We can predict the kinds of impairments people have because we have a lot of information on that. So we should be anticipating them and helping them in advance. 
So this is Tim Sherwood. He's a thoracic surgeon, and he had this really nice patient, Alberta, all right? And he said, and she had early um, lung cancer. But here's the thing. Alberta had had back surgery not that long ago. She was really deconditioned, and Tim Sherwood was like, oh, my goodness. I, I don't know if I can safely get her through this surgery. So here's the surgeon. Put, your, put yourself, how many surgeons in here? Any surgeons? Okay. Put yourself in his situation. He's got to get Alberta safely through surgery. He cannot have Alberta die on the table or there, shortly thereafter. He, just, he doesn't want to have that kind of outcome, right? That, that's a horrific outcome for a surgeon. What is he going to do? Take her to surgery or not? If he doesn't take her to surgery, what's her prognosis? Very different, right? Very different prognosis for a lung cancer patient with early stage cancer if they can't get to surgery. So he decides he's going to um, take her to pre have her do prehab. So he offers her palliative care only and no surgery or palliative care plus rehab and surgery. I'm going to prehab. That's what I'm doing, Alberta said. So there she goes. And guess what? She started out here. She got better with prehab. He operated. She went down. She got more rehab. And then she was back up here. They wanted to do a video of her. They couldn't even track her down. She was out running around so busy. Her health was better after all this cancer treatment and everything else than it was when she was diagnosed. That's like a really interesting paradigm shift because we don't really think about it that way. But I will tell you, I see patients all the time where that could be true. They might have prostate cancer, and they're going to live many, many years, and they actually could have better health than, they, than when they were diagnosed at baseline. So um, just a couple of quick uh, recommendations that came out of an NIH panel, which is you know, to do screening. I mean, if you don't screen for these patients, you don't know. But guess what? If you don't do screening, you know what you can do? Refer them anyway, because pretty much you can say, based on the literature, they're going to have problems. So if you don't do any screening, if you're going to guess one way or the other, guess towards rehab, because you're going to be right most of the time. Second thing I just want to say is in selected cancers, um, you know, the prehab part may be important. Same with upcoming ICU stays, same with cardiac, same with orthopedic surgery, spine, same with lots of things. I love it that you said you learned that word prehab and you can't get it out of your mind now. I hope all of you feel that way. Thank you.